So we've got a good crowd in, uh, in our webinar classroom here. So I think we'll go ahead and, and get started. Um, my name is uh, Amy Cunningham. I'm the Deputy Director at the Vermont Arts Council, and I serve as the coordinator for the Vermont Creative Network. Uh, thank you all for coming out this afternoon virtually. A few housekeeping items. This event is being live captioned by White Coat Captioning. So to view the captions during the event, click on the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, um, and then click on show subtitles to view the captions on your screen. You can also view a full page text of the captions by clicking on the link that my colleague Deirdre has just posted in the chat. Uh, and this will open the captions in a separate browser for you to view. Um, I'm glad to, to welcome our speaker, Katie Buckley, here today. She's going to uh, talk us through Municipal ARPA, and uh, then we're going to talk, uh, take questions at the end of the session uh, after she's gone through her slides. But feel free, you'll see we've got that chat function open. Feel free to um, log your questions in um, at any time, and we'll make sure uh, to cover as many as we can today. And you may also use the chat function to communicate any technical issues you're having along the way. Um, please do let us know and we will try to help you out. At the Arts Council, we open our public events and convenings with the land acknowledgement to recognize that the land we stand on is the traditional unsurrendered territory of the Abenaki people, one of five Wabanaki nations who have had a continual and enduring presence here since time immemorial. We've learned that in Abenaki, Waban is the white flickering light in the sky and Aki is the word for land or the earth. So Wabanaki are the people of the Dawnland. We acknowledge their ancestors, their history and their presence, which continues to this day. So thanks again for coming out. I'm happy to be here for this second of our Vermont's Creative Future Advocacy Sessions. Uh, I encourage you to learn more about the advocacy work of the Vermont Creative Network uh, on our website. And I believe that link will pop up in our chat in a minute. Uh, there are, there's a toolkit. Uh, there it is. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, there's a, a toolkit. You can sign up for action alerts and learn more about the action plan for the creative sector uh, on our website there. So uh, again, today's focus, last week we talked about the statewide advocacy agenda. Today's focus is about the opportunities for investments in the creative sector via municipal ARPA funds. And I'm very pleased uh, to present Katie Buckley, uh, who is serving uh, in a new role with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. She is the director for the ARPA Coordination and Assistance Program. So the Vermont League of Cities and Towns um, is, is the uh, kind of key convener and information provider and coordinator to help municipalities uh, wade through this new uh, uh, big initiative. Um, so uh, Katie, we appreciate uh, the help from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns in helping us understand how creative sector investments um, might be made uh, through this um, significant federal funding opportunity. And Katie, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Great, thank you, Amy, very much. I'm really happy to be here today. I'm excited for the conversations that we've been having and to have everyone who's joined us today. So I have a slide presentation that I am going to um, attempt to share my screen here. Um, can you see that? Excellent, thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna move quickly through, I have 19 slides, I'm gonna move very quickly through them um, with the idea that the very best part of any of these sessions comes through the robust question and answer period at the end. Um, so this uh, is the ARPA funds and creative sector presentation. Um, what we'll cover today is Vermont's share of ARPA funding, uh, the timeline, Eligible and ineligible uses, spending and reporting, Vermont and nationally, Vermont League of Cities and Towns and Regional Planning Commissions, and ARPA and the creative sector. We felt that maybe it was best to start with a little bit of background information on this unique funding, since um, everybody sort of comes to the table with different understandings and it's, um, it's new and it is different, that's for sure. So Vermont is getting about $1.25 billion of ARPA funding. Um, this table right here shows 
how the funds are allocated throughout the state. The state of Vermont itself gets a little over a billion dollars and that will go out through state agencies and other um, organizations throughout the state. Um, if, for any of you following the news, there was $121 million in county money that was allocated and seen that we don't really have county government um, in the state of Vermont, that funding thanks to our congressional delegation and governor and the league itself all push, pushing on treasury to, to reallocate that money to Vermont's municipalities, which that, that ultimately did happen. We have two metro cities in the state of Vermont. They are Burlington and South Burlington. They got their money directly from treasury. All the rest of the towns, cities and villages in the state are known as non-entitlement units. Um, any use, you'll hear that term um, used, and that's essentially every municipality in the state except Burlington and South Burlington. Um, the timeline, and so ARPA, the American Rescue Plan Act, was implemented, uh, was passed in March, and it's actually implemented through the interim final rule. So that's the rules of the road for all of us with the law itself, um, and it's everything spelled out in there. Uh, 39 pages of text that tells what you can, what you can't spend. It also lays out the timeline, which is uh, unique in itself. And so the first, it's broken, payments are broken out into two tranches, the two equal tranches. The first payment was made in late August. And so that was the local money and that county money. They came as two separate payments, but that's all now classified as local money. Um, the second payment will come right around the next time, uh, next year around the same time, uh, late summer, early fall. All funds must be obligated by December 31st, 2024. That means committed um, to projects, uh, whether that's under contract, um, it's, it's all sort of chucked up and ready to be spent. And then all funds must be expended by December 31st, 2026. So um, any funds that aren't spent by that date need to be returned to treasury. So as you can see from the timeline, there's quite a bit of runway for for towns to be deciding how to spend their funds. And our uh, sort of motto that we've adopted at the league is take your time, be patient. There's a lot of other federal funding that's landing out there. So um, be strategic and really think about long-term investments for your communities. Um, there are seven categories in which all ARPA spending must fall. Um, they're here on this slide. And I just wanna let you know that my slide deck will be available in a PDF format. Um, afterwards, uh, Amy has it, and all of the links should be live. So when you click through, you'll find um, either definitions, links to resource documents, whatever is in there that's in that cobalt blue, you know, underlined language. It's a it's a link. So those seven categories break out. I know this is a lot on the eyes, forgive me, but there are 66 expenditure categories that those seven categories break down into. So um, this has been a useful tool in talking with municipalities as they're thinking about ways of spending their ARPA funding. Everything has to fit into one of these 66 categories. So it's, it's the rules of the road for your funding um, and when you do reporting. So as you're thinking about projects, as you're thinking about spending, what code is it going to be? I know that's kind of boring and dry, but let's face it, with grant funding, that's how it works. You have to just make sure it is a, a eligible use, eligible expenditure, and you can report out on it um, cleanly. What can't you spend your ARPA money? It can't be a non-fed, it's not, can't be counted as non-federal match. Since the ARPA um, funding is a federal award itself, if you have other uh, big project with other federal awards in it, and you have to have a cash match or some other form of match, your ARPA funding can't be used as that. Um, I've been encouraging municipalities to read your other grant agreements or program guidelines to see what their definition of match is. Um, everyone's a little bit different, but the general rule is that your ARPA funds can't match other federal funds. Um, can't be used for pension funds, can't be used for infrastructure not directly addressed in ARPA, um, no rainy day funds, financial reserves, and you cannot pay down outstanding debt with it. So some things to consider for municipalities with their funding, they can pool funds, which means they can work with other municipalities to um, create uh, projects. Oh, should have turned my ringer off, sorry. Um, to create projects of scale that are more financially sustainable. My best example of that is if two or three communities got together and decided that they all really needed a big priority for their community was childcare. They could create a childcare facility that would service all three. They could pool their funds and they could, um, provide uh, 
more funding and have it be more financially sustainable in terms of funding it. Um, you can transfer your funds. So you can transfer your funds to nonprofits, to other municipal entities, third party organizations. So there's flexibility in the money. And going back to what I just said a little slide or two ago, take your time, be patient and think bigger. Um, a lot of communities are really entertaining ideas around the infrastructure component in ARPA, which is water and wastewater um, and broadband. So those are three big ticket items that a lot of Vermont communities are um, looking towards to have this funding matter. Um, spending and reporting. So um, the legislative body in a municipality, select board, Board of Aldermen, City Council, some instances, the town manager um, is the ultimate arbiter of, of the ARPA, how the ARPA funds are spent. So at the end of the day, they are the decision makers. It's not like they put together a list, send it up to Treasury and Treasury says yes or no. They decide. Buck stops there. State's not involved, even though the money came through the state of Vermont. The state has no oversight over the local um, ARPA money. Only when a town applies for some of the state ARPA money does the state get to have oversight there. Um, so as such, all municipalities report directly to Treasury. Um, and all municipalities other than Burlington uh, have an annual reporting schedule. So, and there's, there's a pretty robust reporting component to this. Um, and we have all of the resources on our ARPA page on um, Vermont Lincoln Cities and Towns website. So if you have any lingering burning questions after this about um, FA, we have FAQs, we have links to all the documents, everything you wanted to know and more is on our website. Um, so we got an update. I know this is a, like a not a very friendly on the eyes slide, forgive me, but we um, had an update to the compliance and reporting document on November 5th, which was really very timely and important. And um, it clarified that there are two types of recipients of, a, of ARPA funds for a municipality. Up until that point, everyone was considered a sub-recipient um, and they brought clarity around the language, which was really kind of important. Um, so it spelled out that if you give money to um, an individual, an organization, um, direct assistance, that sort of stuff. They're beneficiaries, they're not subrecipients, which means they don't have to comply with all of the, um, they don't have to sign the award terms and conditions. They don't have to um, follow uniform guidance, that sort of stuff. And so if a municipality um, is granting, subgranting its funds to um, another entity to carry out services on its behalf that it can't carry out itself, then it's a subrecipient. And then they sign the grant agreement, the receiving organization, they comply with all of the, um, the regs and uniform guidance. So it's a pretty important distinction if um, you're used to navigating in the grant world, um, that will ding right off to you. It's a, it's a meaningful change. So we were glad to see that. Here are some ideas um, pulled from the headlines of what towns are considering doing with their ARPA funds throughout the state. You see, as I mentioned, a lot of water, wastewater, sewer, all that sort of stuff in there. Um, a lot of towns are still very much in the idea phase because there's such a long timeline for this funding. Um, and because we don't actually have a final rule yet, we only have, we're operating an, under an interim final rule and guidance has been changing. Um, a lot of municipalities are, are doing exactly what we hope they do, which is to sit back and be patient and um, think about how they want to have deep impact with their funding um, in their communities going forward. And there's a real opportunity for that. It's not going to it's not enough funding to solve every problem, but it is enough funding that you can do things that you never would have been able to do before. Um, and if you compare it with other funding opportunities, you get to leverage and, and get even more done. Um, this is a pretty cool, this link is live here for um, National League of Cities. They did a local action tracker. And although uh, those 443 communities that have reported in are, are largely cities with probably bigger scale than our entire state, um, there are ideas in there that are, some are transferable to Vermont. And so it's interesting to look and see what um, our neighbors across the country are doing uh, and entertaining doing with their funding. There's some really great stuff that's being kicked around. So if you're interested, take a little ride through that um, interactive uh, website there. It's pretty cool. 
Um, so this is me. The Vermont League of Cities and Towns received funding um, in the last legislative session through the Agency of Commerce. We have a, a grant and I do ARPA all day, every day. Um, and I work with municipalities throughout the state. I work with um, those who touch municipalities, state government, um, just trying to make sure that we help our municipalities navigate this really interesting and different funding tool um, to ensure that they have everything that they need to be successful, both from accepting the funding all the way through to um, reporting out and keeping it to avoid clawback. So um, we have a dedicated web page. Uh, I have a my own email, we have a dedicated email address. I work in partnership with our regional planning commissions who also received some funding. Um, so I work very closely with the RPCs throughout the state, hand in glove. Um, they're, they're more of the boots on the ground with communities every day and they have their territories, territories and they know their towns very well. Um, so I've had the uh, great opportunity to work with them so that we can really provide the best services that we can provide to municipalities. So how does the creative sector fit into ARPA? I know that those were the boring dry ARPA slides, but I felt like I had to go through those just to lay the groundwork. So we um, have worked with Vermont Arts Council and created uh, this two page document that is a great roadmap for folks to follow. Uh, that link right there in the middle takes you to a PDF of that on our website. And Amy, I don't know if you guys also have a link um, on your website, I bet you might. Um, we do, and we just put it in the chat as well. Awesome, thank you so much. Cause I know, again, that's a lot on the eyes. If only you could get one slide in PowerPoint to be a portrait versus a landscape, um, that would be great. Um, so as you're thinking about approaching a municipality for some of their ARPA funding, there are some things to think about. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm not gonna get too into the, this slide, you can look at it another time, but I just wanna remind folks that every municipality is different and that this is, this is brand new funding. It's like giving money to a municipality and saying to them, here you go, you're a grantor. And for anybody who has been in that role where you receive money and you have to grant it out, or you've sat on a, a selection committee for grant applications or anything like that, you, you understand how challenging it is to stand up a program and put all of the, the nuts and bolts of it together, select, and then administer. And so now we're asking every small town in the state of Vermont to do exactly that. And so, um, Everyone is figuring it out. It's a uh, it's a blessing and a curse. This funding it's it's messy in that it came out very fast without a lot of um, guidance surrounding it, and there's a lot of gray. So folks are um, we're figuring it out as we go. So patience and kindness and all of that is a on everyone's part is incredibly important and helpful here. Um, and so being really clear in what you want and why you need it um, and being succinct because when municipalities have to report out to treasury, their project narratives have to be 250 words or less. And for anyone who's tried to write something <laughs> really important and 250 words or less, that's pretty hard to do. So um, just kind of keep that in mind that uh, expenditure category, um, that's, a, I know it's not blue, my apologies, but that takes you to the 66 um, category. So if you can include what, what category you're requesting under, you're just making it that much easier for the municipality to understand your request. Um, and really what sets you apart, think of it like a grant so that you want to be very compelling in your ask, very clear in your ask. Um, and the more that you can show benefit to the community that you're asking, even better. Um, and your request is a public record. So just keep that in mind as well as you're making your presentations um, to communities asking for funding if you do, um, that it is a public record. So, um, and so I love the question and answer period. And I, I'm just gonna put it out there that I don't always have an answer. Sometimes I have to go back and do a little homework if it's a tricky one um, or ask some of my uh, peers in other states who are doing similar work. Um, so I'll do my best 
And if you need to follow up any questions I don't get to today, if you want to lob them my way, that's my contact information. Um, and I would be delighted to talk to you. So let's see if I can figure out how to stop sharing. Thank you so much, Katie. Oh, really thank you. And I would encourage folks um, to fill up our chat with all sorts of questions. Um, I'll pitch a first question to you, Katie. And that is um, that really helpful last slide around how to go about making a request. You mentioned that you know all of these municipalities are different, obviously, mm -hmm. and they are handling this in different ways. Um, first step, you know, if you were a person living in a small town and you wanted to just begin the conversation, first step might be to find out from your town manager. Yep. What the if you have a town manager. If you have a town administrator, if you have neither, um, it might be a select board assistant, or if you don't have that, it might be a town clerk or a select board member. And just depending find out upon what the, the, town. What the process yep. is going to be. Yep. Yeah. It's it's uh, really whoever uh, assists in creating and posting the agenda for a, a select board meeting. That's the person to maybe ask and say, hey, would I, does it make sense for me to get on an agenda? What's what's the process? How can I how can I get um, either on an agenda or, or become part of the conversation? Great. And just a one thing that's that I didn't cover in the slides, but I do want to call out is um, you know a lot of grant funds when you uh, apply for a federal grant, there's a public hearing component or a public um, engagement component to it. ARPA doesn't have that. It's it's implied, but it's not a requirement. And so um, having a robust it, community engagement is looking very different in every community throughout Vermont. Um, and so in some communities, it's just a standing item on a select board meeting agenda. In other communities, they have a dedicated ARPA webpage with surveys and real like a really great tools for gathering feedback from the public. And so everybody's different in that regard, um, but it's largely discretionary money. Um, you know, it's, I call it a grant turned on its head because normally you would have a project, you'd figure out what you'd wanna do, and then you figure out how to fund it and you go identify all those grants where you'd write those competitive applications. You'd, you'd almost shape your project around that funding source right? It, it provides you with the rules of the road for the project. In this instance, you don't even have the project. You just have the funding. And so it's largely discretionary, which um, anything discretionary in the public realm to invite the public in and be a part of that is the very best way um, to have voices heard. So. Great. Thank you. We have a couple questions in the chat. Um, first off is the whether the arts subrecipients have to be nonprofits. Uh, they don't. They could be for profit. Um, I, I haven't had that question a lot, to be honest with you. In fact, this might be the first time I've got asked about for profit. Um, but I, I can do research on that if there's a particular for profit. And I am. Um, I do understand that one uh, allowable use from municipal ARPA it would is um, emergency funding to hard hit sectors. And so those some of those sectors would inevitably be for profit. So that would lead me to believe that. Yes, it would be a exactly. Yeah. Uh, and uh, to go back to that for a lot of smaller communities that do want to do direct assistance, we're encouraging them to direct folks to some of the existing programs at the state level where there's ARPA funding and, and really exhaust the um, state dollars first before committing local dollars because, because of the reporting and compliance aspect. And if they already have a program that can handle that, you could backstop it or you could augment it. Um, but duplicating a service delivery isn't super efficient. A uh, question about the copy of the slides. Uh, yes, we will be sharing a copy of the slides after this so that all of those hyperlinks that Katie mentioned will be live there. Another question about um, if we'd like to uh, a grant to do work in a different municipality than where we are based, what do you recommend in terms of our narrative around that? Um, are, are you, 
are you looking for funding from multiple communities? That would be my first question. And if you are looking for funding from multiple communities, you'd want to have a methodology methodology for calculating your ask so that um, towns can feel, you know, if you put a dollar per capita, you know, something like that. So you can justify the ask and how you arrived at it and how it's fair and equitable based on um, each community. Right. Um, and we've got another, I believe this is a, maybe a comment more than a question, a like-minded, oh, in terms of who to reach out to, like-minded planning commissioners or economic development folks can help with presentations to select boards. So definitely. Mm -hmm. um, a question here, uh, can a nonprofit, okay, I think this is similar to Elisa's question. Can a nonprofit in one town request funding from another town mm -hmm. proposing a project in that town? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, great, let's see here. And in, for a lot of nonprofits, they have a service area. So while they might be based in one town, there could be a whole service area. They have a clearly defined catchment area yeah. where they can yep. say, we serve this town. Yeah. Yep. Great. Um, is the state polling Vermont towns about common needs or wants that are more universal to the state? Or is the distribution of funds atomized to the strictly local level? I understand uh, less. I might, um, I might try and read that one. Who, who is the? Uh, this one is. Is it way up in the chat? <laughs> Sorry. It's somewhere in the middle. Uh, it's uh, yeah. James Lockridge. Um, and I, I do, I understand legislators. Okay, I got it. Okay, cool. Is the state polling for that? Um, this, Yes, but it's more around infrastructure. Sorry, I just had to read the question again <laughs> for myself there. Um, the state did a request for information and it was largely around uh, water, sewer, broadband and housing. So um, the, the funding at the state level, we're trying to keep coordinated with them, both around um, what they're, how they're looking to deploy it and the needs of communities. So trying to make sure that the opportunities for local funds to pair up with state funds are optimized. I hope I'm answering that question um, the very best way, but, but there, there's a lot of people collecting information. And you know that's the tricky part of this is that the only time we'll really get information without driving it from the bottom up is through treasuries reporting portal and that's once a year and that's for projects that are already underway so we don't get to actually see what's what's churning and what comes up so we're trying to create a dashboard um we're working with the state and sorry to get weedy here but um the league is working with the state of Vermont on creating um, some form of a transparency dashboard for local funding and hoping that we can partner with the RPCs to help ensure that that dashboard gets populated, um, that it doesn't have to be at the town level uh, and it can, it can push projects out there that others can see without waiting an entire year and then having them be in retrospect. Uh, we're also looking to try and do an idea dashboard where it's a lot like that local action tracker at the National League of Cities, but to create something like that where um, folks could enter their ideas into it. And so we could see that on the Vermont level. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. I, I, it's easier said than done. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I have heard um, just the informal conversation that some RPCs and, and RDCs are kind of considering doing that on more regional levels to help yep. folks. Yep, um, we'd love to have it all knit together because yeah. it, it doesn't mean that somebody up in Grand Isle County can't learn from somebody down in Wyndham County. And so really having it knit together will be critical, I think. Absolutely. Um, okay, we've got a lot of good questions here. I, I will say that I think that some of these questions are rather specific in terms of, um, and will be up to a particular mun municipality to decide. Um, so um, let's see here. Cindy is asking, is there assistance available to creatives 
to use in convincing a community of the importance of using these funds in part for creative endeavors. I would say, Cindy, that um, we would be happy at the Vermont Creative Network. This, uh, the flyer that uh, the LCT helped us put together is a great start in terms of it lays out the why and some of the hows for how creative sector investments can be made in the municipal ARPA. But Cindy, we'd, we'd be happy to help. I don't know how much capacity we have to do it on a huge level, but that's, um, we're definitely interested in helping folks make the case. Um, and again, I'll point you back to our advocacy page where there's a toolkit for some great kind of general creative economy um, one pagers. Um, sorry, Katie, did you want to jump in? No, on that? no. Well done. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, not Katie's, uh, Kathy's got a question about the difference between individuals or artists and subrecipients. Is this something that an individual artist can ask for? Um, I think that that would depend on, on how the municipality decides to invest these funds. And so I, I hypothetically, I could see a successful case being made for a public art project or something that for which a, you know, an individual artist would, would be the, the sub grantee there. Right. Yep. Because they'd actually be contracted by the municipality. And, right. and even then it could just be an expense depending upon how you, how you want to look at it. I know that's kind of financially weedy, but if you were an artist and you, uh, you had a real loss due to COVID, you could ask the municipality for direct assistance. That's one of the eligible uses. The municipality might point you towards the state to, to say, hey, chase those funds first with the state. And if you come back and you've exhausted all your options that way or weren't eligible for whatever reason, the community could provide direct assistance. And at that point, you'd be a beneficiary, not a subrecipient. Thank you. Uh, I think that answers another question about individuals. Um, Robin's got a question. Can a nonprofit request dollars for a project they are working on that benefits the town or community? I would say, mm -hmm. yes, yes, make the case. Right. Yeah, make the case. Mm -hmm. um, and the, Tim, I see you've got a you've got a, a big one, and I'm going to try and circle back to that. But I do realize it's rather specific, so I'm going to go through some of these others first. Uh, Kathy, yes, the Arts Council did receive ARPA funds straight directly from the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, and those funds were distributed in coordination with Vermont Humanities, our partners at Vermont Humanities, and we distributed those through a program called Cultural Recovery Program. So that. That program just closed. We distributed a little over a million dollars to cultural organizations. Part of our statewide request uh, to the legislature this year, uh, which we think would be primed to come from ARPA funds, is, is a request for further uh, emergency relief. Again, coming from the state ARPA fund path, which is mm -hmm. separate but parallel to the municipal ARPA path. And if there are any legislators on the call, I believe there's $600 million, like of, of the over, you know, a little over $1 billion, um, a little less than half has already been allocated out and that the remainder will um, be addressed in this upcoming session. So that's what you're speaking of, Amy. And I can actually answer that question from Tim Schwartz. Oh, terrific. As, Thank yeah, you. as someone who participated in a, a local Grange project, almost exactly oh. like this one. <laughs> um, yes, and so you you said um, the sort of key ARPA words, which is improvements in our ventilation system. So you're making changes to a public space that will allow for safe, um, it's prevention and mitigation of COVID. Right, investments in public facilities. I can tell you it's item 1.7 expenditure category. So if you're gonna ask for funding, just go under that one, that's what it is. Um, and it is for public facilities where you're improving it and making this, this space safe. And so um, you can make a request for funding from your community if you so choose. Thank you. Um, some questions about a statewide organization. Can we request funding in the various locations you serve? Yes, you, mm -hmm. you could choose to do that, to go to each municipality. Um, and the average amount for the grants, uh, Sasha, that varies entirely. If you're interested in seeing what each municipality actually got, you can see that on the VLCT site. But in terms of- It's in of my slide deck too. Oh, in the slide deck. Yeah, yeah, in that Vermont share. If in the bottom there, it says, if you want to see all the payments, click here. It'll take you right to the distribution for 
um, a table for the entire state, every town, city, and village in the state. So Sasha, in terms of any sub-grants that could uh, come down to the creative sector, that would depend entirely on the municipality and, and what kind of program they decide to, to lift up. Um, another question, are municipalities required to provide sub-grants? Um, I don't think so. They can, they've got, as you were saying, wide berth to choose how they invest these funds. They can choose to spend however they want to spend them. And, you know, there could be some communities who identify one project, it's all going to that. Um, and others who are, you know, maybe some are taking 20% of their award and they're going to give it to community nonprofits, taking 20% of their award and going to do infrastructure improvement of anything that they can. You know, you can, you can do it however, however you want to spend the money, you can. And one of the, one of the eligible uses is, um, if you were to go back and look through those seven categories, one of them was revenue replacement. And so if towns were to do the calculation um, of the formula that's in the interim final rule, which includes a 4.1% revenue growth year over year, most towns will be able to claim lost revenue based on that. And in doing that, those dollars have the broadest flexibility of all um, up to the amount of the, the loss of the revenue reduction um, and can be spent on the provision of government services. And the provision of government services is really anything a municipality would spend their money on in a given year. So that can include, you know, highway fund, general fund, any of that sort of stuff, those types of expenses. Got it, very helpful. And then Sarah asked if we could share a few examples or ideas of creative economy projects that would fit the ARPA bill. Um, and we definitely can, I think for, uh, these purposes, we'll talk about the municipal ARPA bill. Um, and so again, that, that um, two pager has some general ideas, um, but I can say that you know, some of those examples would be uh, direct assistance, again, recognizing that uh, the creative sector was among um, the hard hit industries like travel and tourism. Uh, mm -hmm. So direct assistance programs uh, could be feasible improving or increasing uh, digital capacity and digital skills and small business entrepreneurship skills, uh, again, to build the creative sector and other sectors. Um, that, is, uh, that, would, that would be an example. Uh, the infrastructure pieces that I guess, you know, Tim's example of the Grange and other infrastructure pieces, um, uh, improvements for libraries, theaters, studios, galleries, performance spaces, um, that those are also possibilities. Um, and then I would say, I would also lift up kind of creative placemaking kinds of projects, mm -hmm. public art. Um, outdoor spaces. Mm -hmm. Outdoor spaces, assistance yeah. to small business, cultural organizations, enhancing public spaces, um, uh, improving the built environment that could include performance spaces, things like that. Um, so those are a couple of, uh, of examples there. And everybody's ARPA funding, is the same, the rules are the same. So the local funding, state funding, I'm gonna guess the, the, the national funding probably that was went out, is it to the National Endowment of the Arts? The, we, all the rules are exactly the same. I guess it's all the same. You got it. Mm -hmm. So if it was eligible there, it's eligible here at Great. this level. Mm -hmm. Great, pending the municipality's decision to use it. Yes, mm -hmm. yep. Great. Um, let's see, and another Grange question, a 501c8, not a 501c3, is that a barrier or would that be a local municipal decision? Um, you know what, I don't, that's a great question actually. I don't know if there's specificity on 501c3 in the interim final rule. What is a, uh, oh, it's a, it's a fraternal organization, correct? That's what it says here, yes. Okay, um, I don't know. I don't know. Thanks, Katie, Tim. Yeah. Good job. You get the gold star. For the and only because our Grange um, became a 501c3 and acquired the Grange building from the fraternal order. So that's why ours was different. Um, I will check though. So we do have a few more minutes if there's any other uh, questions that folks would like to, uh, or points of discussion. Um, We'll, we'll hang out for a few more minutes and see if folks have anything. We'll put up uh, the link to that. 
this and we will distribute the slide deck. We'll put it on our the web page that we have set up for this advocacy series um, and the uh, the recording. And the well, one page, the the document that's on our website, all the content was provided to us by Vermont Arts Council, and it. We put it together pretty quickly, so I need to make sure that you guys are on the bottom of that. It just, it has all of our sort of look, but it's your content. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world to adjourn a little early at 5.15 on a, oh, here we go. We have another question. Have all Vermont towns already applied for this funding or, or been awarded funding? Um, there was, only a certification process. There was no application. All you needed to do is basically fill out 20 easy questions, which are as easy as my name, my phone number, <laughs> that sort of stuff, a DUNS number. And uh, I think the DUNS number and furnishing a, a annual budget number were the hardest things to do. And it was basically saying yes, here, yes, and we will accept the funds. And to uh, all eligible communities with the exception of one accepted the funding. And it, uh, so half of their award, so if you received a half million dollar award, $250,000 is cash in the bank right now in every Vermont municipalities. It collects interest and they're allowed to keep the interest. And so the other second half of that, if in our example, 250,000 would come next year around the same time. And uh, let's, the, um, we've got a question. How do you find out how much our community was awarded? There is a link. It'll be in the slide deck and it's also on the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. You can download the spreadsheet that has all of the awards. Um, Daniel is going. And they're big. Like if you looked at the awards just for the local payment, it's nice, you know, it's nice to have money, but all of a sudden you put that county money on top of it and that's real money that's going out to communities. That's the difference. Daniel um, was wondering if the town, the list in the slideshow doesn't, does that mean that his town did not receive funding? Um, I would double check that spread. It's a very long spreadsheet. So I would double what's check the, that. What's the town if you want to pop it in the. Daniel, if you want to, if you want to pop the town in or you can check the spreadsheet. Yeah. And in the meantime, uh, oh, Pulteney. Pulteney. Oh, it got money. It got funded. Yeah. In fact, I know it did because I took, talked to the a person from Pulteney. Mm -hmm. And then Rose's question is around timeline. What do you think the timeline is for making the request of our select board or is that specific to each town? Specific to each town and, and really their public engagement process. Right. You know, like uh, it could, there could be towns that get their money out the door like that. And there could be towns that say, you know what, we're going to take the next year, 12 months, and here's the plan of how we're going to carry out you know, in the next 12 months, here we're going to have this public engagement session, here we're going to do this. And by this date, we're going to have all of our, it, it can be different in every community, depending upon how each legislative body, every select board, whoever um, wants to carry that process out. And so it, it could, it's, a, it's appropriate for a resident of a particular town or municipality to, um, you know, express their opinion that, that a municipality take some time on this, like yeah. as, as VLCT is, is encouraging yeah. that, you know, and, let's and take ask. Off the public input, mm -hmm. not just yeah. by the comfort and call it done, right? Yeah. Everybody's different. And so go to your town's website, do a little sniffing around on the website, you know, if it's there, if not ask, just ask. I find town clerks are awesome and they know everything. Usually that's like the go-to person, right? So between your select board, if there's a select board assistant in your town clerk, you could probably find the answer to everything in your town. <laughs> that's great. Well, I think we have answered a lot of questions. Katie, thank you so much. You really have um, yeah, um, an encyclopedia and I appreciate it. There's so many different Elements. It's exciting. It's an exciting time. It's, it's scary and it's, it's, it's exciting all at the same time. So, um, and like I said, I, my contact information is there. Don't be shy. I get a lot of inquiries. It might take me a couple of days to get back to you. Um, but feel free to lob them my way. Terrific. So I want to uh, encourage folks um, again to visit our advocacy page. 
visit the ARPA section of the Vermont League of Cities and Towns page. We will share out uh, Katie's full slide deck and we are recording this webinar. Uh, I'd also encourage all of you. So, you know, last week we did the state advocacy session. This one is focused on the town level. At the end of the month on November 30th, we're having another session where we're zooming out to the national level. So we've got Narek Rome from the Americans for the Arts who's gonna come and talk about um, the various, uh, the, there's, there's quite a lot of pretty significant legislation that Congress is considering right now that impacts the creative sector in lots of different ways. So we hope you'll join us for that November 30th session. And um, yeah, thanks to everyone for being here. Thank you. All right. Have a good night, everyone.